as it was nearing its uh, completion. The structure of the dam is outlined quite well. The uh, cranes were still in place, which were used to lift the uh, granite blocks one upon the other from barges that were floated to the work site from the quarries. So this is a picture that must go to about 1904 or close to 1905, near the completion of the dam. In the 1880s and 90s, um, the city was as it is today, the area, undergoing tremendous population growth. Water companies uh, did not have any on-river or online storage of water. They were content merely to pump water from the South Platte River and send it through a few miles of pipe to their customers. This worried pioneers like Walter Scott Cheeseman and David Moffat, who were involved with consolidating small water companies into the Denver Union Water Company. That consolidation took place in the 1890s. It was quite apparent to them that if the city were to survive, it would need a dependable supply of water. That meant saving some upstream, somewhere along the river. So they started work in the 1890s, late 1890s, on finding a site, and their chief engineer, C.P. Allen, had walked miles along the river looking for dam sites. And the first one he found for upstream storage from Denver was on Goose Creek, which is close to the present Cheeseman Dam. And construction was started on that site around 1898 in that vicinity. However, the spring floods of 1900 just washed everything out. But in 1900, the decision was made to rebuild at an alternate location that Allen had found. And the decision was made to build far more substantially. So it was started in 1900 and completed amazingly by 1905. The Denver Union Water Company, which built Cheeseman Dam, was a private concern and, of course, was always looking for, for income and money. They formed a subsidiary company to build Cheeseman. And the story goes, and purely a story, that when the subsidiary company was running short of cash, that Walter Scott Cheeseman dug into his own pocket to finish it and complete the project. Now, I don't know if I can find a fact to back that up anywhere, but it sounds as though it might be something that could very well have happened because of this zeal that both Cheeseman and Moffat had for making sure that Denver would have the necessary infrastructure to survive. And water, of course, was their, their prime concern. Well, the stones were quarried right here on the site, and they were cut by Italian stonemasons who had come over to this country to work on this project, bringing their very special skills along with them. The stones, they were often referred to as uh, native granite ashlar blocks, the ashlar simply being a, a square or a rectangular block, and uh, simply piled one atop the other as water rose behind the structure that they were building. It so blended in with the environment, because it was a native stone, that in 1973, the American Society of Civil Engineers designated this as a National Historic Landmark. It is considered to be a dam constructed with environmental integrity, uh, built even in 1905 to blend well into its surroundings, which it, which it does. This is what they refer to as a gravity arch dam. There is a curvature to it, which deflects the weight of the water stored behind it away from the dam structure itself and into the surrounding canyon walls so that the dam uh, receives really its strength from the whole countryside surrounding it. It's, um, it's quite unique. When it was completed in 1905 with a spillway that's 211 feet above the stream bed. It was considered the highest gravity arch dam in the world. And Denver had received some, some kind of distinction for having built a structure like this. And it provided the first online storage. Cheeseman Dam, when it was built, could store 89,000 acre feet of water behind it. And because of the nature of this watershed, the gravelly nature of the ground, which reduces silt, Today it still stores 
89,000 acre feet of water behind it. And if you look at the waters of uh, Lake Cheeseman behind the dam, you'll find it very clear, very clear water indeed. Much of what is done here is controlled by state water law through the state engineer's office. Say there are senior water rights holders downstream, maybe a, maybe a farmer up in Weld County who has a priority ahead of Denver is calling for his water, then water's got to be released from this reservoir to take care of those needs. It also works in concert with the demand in the city. Uh, hot summer days create demands of sometimes as much as 500 million gallons in one day. And if we have our water stored here, it's close enough in to be released and get down to the, uh, to the treatment plants and then into the city. In 1971, they installed five valves in the dam. Uh, up to that point, the water was coming off the top of the dam, and so the river would freeze in the wintertime. It would be cold water coming down it, and uh, the valves take it off the bottom, which maintains a pretty constant temperature, and the river doesn't freeze anymore. It gets a little ice, ice around the edges, but it does not freeze in the winter. And we have fishermen up here now year-round. Uh, it seems that we, we have what we call the Orvis Hatch on the river which uh, means that the fishermen are out by the numbers. <laughs> For a long time, because it is public water supply, it had been closed, but there is now public access to most of the shoreline, uh, except in the vicinity of the dam itself and in the vicinity of the uh, water supply facilities. Well, the activities are mostly shore fishing. There's an the opportunity to do a little, uh, oh, a little, um, camping out along, not, not overnight, but uh, just along the edge of the, uh, of the reservoir. One of the most popular fishing spots is below the dam, along the South Platte River. It's a known fact in the state that uh, dams create excellent fisheries because of the release of the water, the temperature of the water, oxygenation of the water, uh, provides excellent pools for trout especially, so that one of the, uh, what they consider gold metal waters, of the state is right below Cheeseman Dam and a very popular spot for fishermen. Fishing is, uh, uh, is excellent. Uh, the Platte, of course, is the, the Goldwater River and uh, uh, all you have to do is open up any sports magazine and you'll find what a wonderful place that is. As a matter of fact, the Platte River is flowing through Cheeseman Dam. It comes right through the valve house and uh, that's the whole flow of the South Platte from up at its headwaters down into the city. When I was uh, probably 12, 13 years old, an old man came by and talked to my daddy. He claimed that he had been working uh, on the uh, Cheeseman Dam as they were building it. And uh, I guess we feel certain that it was probably the first dam. And he wanted to go to Denver. And so he hired a man with a buckboard at Cheeseman to bring him to Daffodale, which is a stage stop, which was uh, this place, Fletcher's Ranch. And from there, he took the stage to South Platte and then the narrow gauge into Denver. It took him two days and a night to go from Cheeseman to Denver. That has always uh, fascinated me. We can pick about an hour and 15 minutes today if the roads are good and the traffic's not too bad. It continues to be a, a key element in the Denver water supply system. Because it was first in the series of reservoirs built for Denver, it has old water rights. And under the state law, this is a very convoluted system of allocating water, which gives the right to use water to those who first acquire it. And Cheeseman was built on very early water rights, going into the 1880s and 90s. So that means that it's a primary source of water. Other structures that came later were more junior, and they do not, under dry year conditions, have the ability under the state's water law to store as early or as much water as you can in Cheeseman. So it's important. It's very important in the ongoing structure of the, of the whole community to make sure that there is an adequate supply of water.